This is A View from the Bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. In one sense, the Nephilim never left, but in another, they are going to return in, in a very crucial point in the history of humanity. Watch this. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me tonight is a gentleman who has somehow decided to take his law degree and apply it to researching the uh, the writings of Bible commentators, scholars from years gone by, and then apply that to history and end times prophecy. He's a best-selling author, Judgment of the Nephilim, a number one bestseller at Amazon. His brand new book is uh, the follow-up to it, the final Nephilim, and we are honored to welcome back to the program Ryan Peterson. Ryan, it's good to see you again. Derek, great to see you. So excited to be back, and uh, thank you so much for having me. Your book, uh, Judgment of the Nephilim and, and the Final Nephilim, basically uh, touching on, on various aspects of the same subject. Uh, I, can we assume from the title, The Final Nephilim, that uh, there is a role to play for some hybrid creature in, in the future of Earth? Absolutely. Uh, and, and in fact, really, both books, even though Judgment on Nephilim really starts in Genesis 3.15 and weaves and talks about the war of the two bloodlines, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent throughout the Old Testament, the final Nephilim jumps to Revelation and sees, to explore how it all unfolds at the apocalypse at Armageddon, but also starts in Genesis 3.15. And what I really highlight is that we, we you know, the first book really focused on the seed of the woman. The, the, the prophecy of the Messiah, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, and how the, the Nephilim, the fallen angelic incursion, the birth of Nephilim was all the effort to stop and prevent the birth of the Messiah. Well, this there's another seed. You know, Genesis 315 prophesied two seeds. And so God proclaimed that the devil, Satan, would have a seed. And that war would be, to, be, to, be, be between the seed of the woman and thy seed. And that, what I believe, is... The seed of the serpent, who is the Antichrist, who is the final Nephilim. So huge implications in the end times and also emphasizes why Christ said it would be as the days of Noah. Ah, okay. So Matthew 24 comes into play again. Um, The uh, (laughs) title of your very first chapter, The Beginning is the End. Uh, What do you mean by that? Yeah, sure. So what I really explore in the first chapter is when you think about just God and time and time in the Bible, that God, of course, exists outside of time and that what we and that we understand Bible prophecy. I think of time more as a scroll rather than being linear, where things are repeating and cycling all over and over again. And I think scripture supports that. You know, God makes this amazing proclamation in Isaiah 46 when he says that. 
If you want to know how I am God, how I am above the angels, the fallen angels, the demons, that I am the God of gods, he bases it on prophecy. And, he's, and God says, I've declared the end from the beginning. So I believe in that my, what my thesis in the book is that we, you can understand end times prophecy by, if you identify the earliest events in Scripture that God is saying these are going to repeat. These events will repeat over and over again. So uh, so that's really the theme of it. And also I touch on the fact that it, uh, it also incorporates some concepts from, from quantum physics as well. So uh, that's kind of how it all ties together. <laughs> It's right up Josh Peck's alley. Quantum physics just makes my head hurt. I was a C-minus physics student in uh, college, and that was a gift. (laughs) That was a gift. Um, So this this idea that things repeat, we we see some some interesting uh, things in Scripture that that appear to bookend that only really makes sense if you see, if you understand what happened before is going to be repeated. Am, Am I understanding you correctly? Exactly. And we really get the indicators throughout Scripture. We already pointed to one, Matthew 24, the days of Noah. Jesus specifically said that that as it was, that if you want to understand the end times, look to the days of Noah. In the book of Luke, Jesus proclaimed, likewise, as it was in the days of Lot. So Mm -hmm. I really identify four events, the days of Noah, the days of Lot, of course, the Genesis six, I'm sorry, the, um, the Genesis three, that prophecy, but also the Exodus. Which I think, again, just if you think about it, you know, a well-known account for Bible students, but just look at the parallels. You have Moses, a clear foreshadow of Christ leading Israel away from a wicked king, Pharaoh, who, by the way, uh, likely had a crown with a serpent coming out of his forehead on it. Sure, yeah. You know, again, we see these foreshadows of the Antichrist. And then the plagues. You have the plague of water turning to blood. We have that in the end times. You have the locust at the fifth trumpet of Revelation 9. You have locusts that would come from the abyss. Uh, the death of the firstborn. You have the death of the Antichrist, the seed of the serpent. So many parallels, you know, supernatural darkness. So I show how the Bible is showing us that that what these events are going to repeat and that we can discern and understand end time prophecy by filling it in with the, the foreshadows and types from the Old Testament. One of the things that really amazed me in uh, in reading Judgment of the Nephilim, and I see you've done this again in the final Nephilim, is drawn on commentators. Um and Bible scholars from years gone by, and many of these are from uh, you know 18th, 19th century Bible commentators who didn't have the benefit of a lot of archaeological discoveries that have only been made within the last uh, hundred years. And in some cases, as uh, Sharon and I found during our research for our last few books, some of these things have only been translated within the last 40 years or so scholars only recently coming to uh recognize yeah there really was a cult of the dead the canaanites really did venerate the spirits of the rephaim but you're drawing on scholars who saw this without that archaeological background how do you find all of these uh these bible commentators who were so (laughs) insightful before this stuff was dug out of the sand yeah, well, you know, first, of course, praise God for leading me on that route. And that's, you know, it just shows you how God lines things up and, and kind of how you started, where my background of, I, I was, I've done, I have a, a long career of doing lots of research. So God, in my professional career, in my academic career, trained me to do, I've done many, I've spent many hours doing professional research. So I love it and I enjoy it. So once I applied it to biblical research and started stumbling upon these sources, what I found consistently was, the supernatural perspective on the Bible of Genesis 6, the Nephilim, the fallen angels, of all these things we talk about, that was the common understanding in the church going back to the first century, but certainly in 1700s and 1800s. So this movement away that we see in, the, in, the, in most of the church today where they don't even discuss these topics, that, that had not taken place yet. So it's literally a treasure trove of sources. Once you start digging into ancient, I mean, not even ancient, but just commentaries from a couple of centuries ago that... You know, ideas that the Antichrist would be the literal seed of the serpent, that that uh, the fallen angels, the Genesis 6 incursion, this was commonly discussed and they had this understanding. And so I think that's why their writing is so powerful, even though they didn't have the benefit of the archaeological discoveries right, to right. confirm it. Because if they were reading the Bible with the full understanding that this supernatural realm is real, fallen angels are real, demonic powers are all around us, and this is the reality that we live in, that our, these two realms are constantly intersecting. So it informed their writing. And it uh, really showed me that I've had kind of a simplistic understanding of this uh, uh, 
because I, I've you know made a, a point of, of telling people when I, I go out and talk about this and teach about this, write about this, that this was the understanding of the early church until about the time of Augustine in the early 5th century, who popularized the Sons of Seth interpretation of Genesis 6. But I just assumed it's like only in our generation with, uh, say, you know, Chuck Missler and Mike Heiser and L.A. Marzulli have we finally begun to recover this. But you're showing that this was really the understanding Prior to the 20th century, we kind of lost it for a while. Now we're kind of getting this worldview back. Exactly. That's, that, I think that's exactly what happened. I think that at the turn of the century, I think a lot of it was, I think a lot of it was actually well-intentioned. I think it was a, it was a kind of fighting back against evolution and trying to, to, to stand up for the Bible, but by, with the hope that by stripping away a lot of the supernatural, more fringe aspects People who put trust in the Bible and not think that science has trumped the Bible. So I think the intention was good, but the result was bad. We yeah. lost a lot of what the Bible is telling us. And like you said, thanks to Chuck Missler, L.A., yourself, Sharon, we're getting it back now in this generation. Now, just, in t- just in time, too, by the way. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> um, there's a character in here that I want to uh, d- dig into because uh, I- I've talked a lot about him in my most recent book, and that's the Assyrian. Um and I know that this is a, a subject that others have written about as well, but what is your take? You, you describe him as the Antichrist of the Old Testament. Who is the Assyrian, and why do we interpret him as the Antichrist? Sure. So the Assyrian, uh, I believe, is the fallen, the fallen angel who was the preeminent angel in the days of Noah, who was the, you know, the leader of the Genesis 6 rebellion. So not the devil. This is not Satan. This is a, a secondary angel, but he was the, the ruler. And in Judgment of the Nephilim, I put a chap- I devote a chapter going through Ezekiel chapter 31, which I believe chronicles his rise and fall. Yes. I call it an esoteric passage, just like Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, that's really chronicling his rise in the antediluvian era and also shows his judgment that he was taken down to the abyss by the flood in the days that the flood abated. And so uh, it's really it's, so it's so it's an amazing chapter, but also we see prophecies of him after Genesis. And so what I submit is that he, uh, the sp- his spirit has been permitted and has been prophesied to return as the Antichrist, but it's just referred to as the Assyrian, particularly in the book of Isaiah in chapters 10 to 14. Those chapters are pretty much, again, a chronicle almost the entire career of Antichrist in the end times. And time and time again, he's referred to as the Assyrian. And I even show how it even maps out his route, his actual route he will take heading from Megiddo to Jerusalem to conquer Jerusalem in the end times. It's just amazing. And so that is the title for him in the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, I believe he's referred to as Abaddon or Apollyon. Now, we're, we're very close in our interpretations here because there's a couple of differences, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always open to the possibility that I might be wrong. Uh, but yes, I agree. So when you read in Ezekiel 31, for example, uh, beginning of verse 3, behold, Assyria, or the Assyrian, was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you read further down into that chapter, how it was carried down with the trees of Lebanon the, uh, in, into the, the netherworld. You're seeing this as an exactly. allegory for the punishment of the sons of God from Genesis chapter six. De- definitely, and then with the way, and and to me, the the biblical well, I, what for me the biblical proof is that that at the end of that chapter, it specifically says, "In the day he went down to the nether part, to the netherworld, to the abyss, the the floods were restrained." And of course, what I connected it in Judgment of the Nephilim was that in Genesis eight. We're told that happened after 150 days is when the fountains of the deep, the water receded. And now they were basically like, almost like a whirlpool effect. The angels, the fallen angels were dragged down to the to the netherworld. And then I just jumped to Revelation chapter nine when they are now released from the abyss in the end times at the fifth trumpet. And yes. lo and behold, the same angels who were tormented for 150 days by the floodwaters, now they torment unsaved, unrepentant humanity for five months or 150 days. So it was just really, to me, that kind of shows, that they have, again, the connectivity and, and what I call quantum repetition, how these events are repeating. God's showing us. It's just amazing. So that's, to me, it connects the whole thing, Genesis to Ezekiel to Revelation. Yeah, that that is, uh, and, and we see eye to eye on that. Absolutely agree. So Ezekiel 31 and 32, which uh, gets into the uh, uh, the chiefs of the Gibberim in the midst of Sheol, and uh, 
Assyria yeah. at the edge of the uh, the abyss. Let's see if I can find the verses here, because this is something I did quite a bit of study on. Uh, the mighty chiefs shall speak of them with their helpers out of the midst of Shale. Uh, Assyria is there and all her company, the graves all around it, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit. So you've got these, these chiefs of the Gibberim, uh, the mighty men, and the Septuagint suggests that that was actually a reference to the Nephilim. Uh, but uh, Assyria, or the Assyrian, or Asher, is at the edge, the uttermost parts, of, like, oh, okay, that's, that's a, a separate area of the netherworld, maybe? Right. Yeah. 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 I think there's I, I think there's some good credence to that. And I think, you know, what I also get into regarding the Assyrians, I believe that when you get to Revelation 17 and you have this this prophecy or this declaration that when the angels explain to John what the seven headed beast is and says that there are seven kings, five mm-hmm. are fallen. One is one is yet to come and shall continue a short space. And the eighth is the the beast who is of the seven. What I, I have a chapter in the final lesson where I submit that this spirit of Apollyon has been, has been allowed to be released to indwell seven kings throughout biblical history, the eighth being the actual beast spirit, that will the actual Antichrist. He will indwell the body of the Antichrist, but he's also been permitted to leave the abyss and indwell seven kings throughout history. And at the time, obviously at the time John was writing Revelation, five had already uh, uh, been di- had died already by that time. So. Mm-hmm. So I think it can connect that he's in this special area of the abyss where he can have access that God's allowing to come up for a time and he has to go back down again. Yeah. People have asked me about that question and somebody suggested, I wish I could claim that I invented this, but uh, I, I and I wish I could remember who told it to me to give him proper credit. But it's like a mob boss, you know, a mafia boss or a gang leader who's in prison <laughs> still controlling what's happening on the streets. I mean, if he's chained exactly. up in the abyss, how can he? Con- he's got minions. He's got minions. That's what yeah. uh, that's what's going on here. Those little defil- <laughs> Nephilim spirits that are floating back and forth and carrying messages. So Isaiah 14, right. which is the famous chapter, "How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning?" Um, when you go down to verse 25. Uh, 24, Yahweh of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be, and as I have purposed, so it shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains trample him underfoot. So, again, we're not talking about the imminent invasion by Sennacherib in Isaiah's day. We're talking about an end times prophecy of this entity who was the leader of the rebellion in Genesis 6. Exactly. And I think that, again, that's another verse that really drives it home. So you go through this chronology of this, the rise of the Assyrian, and we get to Isaiah 10, 11, 12, and 13, and it even talks about Israel being deceived by him. It says that they will know, once Israel has their spiritual awakening and realizes that Jesus is Yeshua HaMashiach, it says they shall no longer lean on him that smote them. At the end, they're going to trust the Antichrist for a time and then realize who the real Savior is. And then when you get to that verse in Isaiah 14, it actually says the Assyrian. So again, it's tying it all together that this is the Antichrist, as I say, although it was his title in the Old Testament. He's going to be obviously uh, defeated on the mountains of Israel, you know, at the Mount of Olives in the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Mm-hmm. So it all ties together there. So what's the connection between um, the Assyrian and Gog? Ezekiel 38 and 39. Yes. Yeah, so I, I so I think that, again, that Gog, uh, who I believe, of course, is still to come, will be I, I put him as the seventh. I call them the mystery kings, the satanic mystery. When it comes, again, going back to Revelation 17, that he uh, will be he will indwell that God, whoever that leader in the, that end times assault on Israel. And the reason what I really go to is that when you look at Ezekiel 38, as much as I can say on Ezekiel 38 and 39, but to get to right to what I look to is that it says God poses a question directly to Gog, the Lord. Yahweh poses a question to Gog where he says, are you the one I've spoken of by my servants, the prophets? In the Septuagint, it actually says, you are the one I have spoken of. So again, when we're thinking about who could Gog be? The Bible is very clearly saying this is this is a man or figure who multiple prophets have spoken of. So that takes a lot of people off the board who we normally think of could be leading the God Magog coalition. So I think the reason, but I think when we look at the spirit of the Assyrian and Revelation tells us that this spirit is going to come to earth at different intervals. That's the spirit, it's the Assyrian who the prophets have spoken of throughout Scripture, 
and he will end that spear will end well Gog, you know, it, it, at the time of the Gog Magog invasion. So the uh, the final Nephilim then is this uh, character who will be indwelt by the spirit of the Assyrian. And uh, are you Correct. saying you're yeah. saying then that this will be a hybrid who is created specifically for this purpose? Exactly, that he will be a literal seed uh, of the devil, a hybrid, a Nephilim, but he will be indwelled. And I believe that's I believe that's what happens at the midpoint of the tribulation when he suffers that mortal wound and is then resurrected through occult satanic power. And I believe that's when he's indwelt and becomes the beast. And so, and what I look to as a foreshadow of that is Judas. And, you know, you know, yep. Judas is the only person in the Bible who Satan literally possessed, mm -hmm. you know, right before he betrayed Jesus, as Satan went into him, he was indwelled. And so I think it will be a repetition of what happened with Judas, where he was literally indwelled at the point of the, of the crucifixion. And I also point to with Judas, there's an interesting prophecy of Judas, you know, when we see that we find in the book of Acts, when he's being, when the disciples are replacing him and selecting a new, picking a new disciple to replace Judas, who's now dead. And Peter quotes two excerpts from the Psalms that are prophecies of Judas. One is a prophecy that says that he shall leave his office and another shall take it, which obviously happened. But then Peter makes this statement that Judas went to his own place, referring to, again, to hell, to the abyss. And in his prayer to God, he says he went to his own place. And then the prophecy, the second Psalm specifically says that Satan will, it says, take him, take a man to the, who will betray God and says, and Satan stands at his right hand. So there's a real connection between Judas and being a part of the abyss and being in his place, Satan at his right hand. And I think foreshadows the Antichrist, of course, who will be at the right hand of Satan, who mm -hmm. will, uh, of course, lead and carry out the devil's agenda. So I think that's he's that combination where he is a hybrid, but also will be literally possessed by the spirit and become the beast who declares himself God, goes into the throne of God, proclaims himself that he's God, and everything we see in Revelation 13. It's it's almost scary how closely uh, your analysis of this is tracking with what Sharon and I have been pulling out as we we do our our program unraveling Revelation. Um, we we reached the same conclusion with Judas. Okay, yeah, I mean, why, how how is it possible that a fallen angel indwells somebody? Because I thought that was what demons did, not fallen angels. But Satan did that. Okay, all right. So we've got uh, we've got it. A, 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 exactly. A, let's go back to something you mentioned early on, which is. Uh, really intriguing, which is the uh, the correlation between quantum physics and the biblical symbol of the scroll, the idea that what has happened before will happen again. How does quantum physics fit into that? Yeah, sure. So there's, uh, you know, two ways. So what I explain is two kind of concepts. I think, quant first of all, I think quantum physics is the field, the one field of science that's getting the closest to the spiritual realm. They're really, you know, they are understanding that that when you look at quantum particles, they're not behaving in the normal natural order. And so I think two things I look to is a concept called uh, quantum superposition that sim to say as simply as it can be that a, a, a particle can exist in two different states at once. So an electron can be spinning up and spinning down at the same time simultaneously, which I think is a lot of what the Bible has been saying about God's nature. That Jesus says, I am the Father or one. When he's on earth, standing on earth in Jerusalem, he says, I am the Father or one, even though the Father's in heaven. That they are separate, but they exist at the same time. Mm -hmm, Trinity. Mm -hmm. They are three, and these three are one. And so and I think that so that's one aspect. And there's also this idea of quantum entanglement that you have through that two particles can be connected through time. And and so I think that's how God is using prophecy. That that these types and shadows, God said in uh Ecclesiastes, the thing that that shall be has been, right? The thing that was what shall be. There's nothing new under the sun. So God's telling us that things will repeat. In Hosea, he says he speaks through similitudes, which are types and shadows. So God is using the events of scripture, even involving what decisions he, that biblical character, biblical figures make to, to show types and shadows, whether it's Moses, whether it's Joseph, whether it's Pharaoh foreshadowing Antichrist. And so I think that in that, prophecies are connected. And so, you know, we sometimes we talk about a double fulfillment of prophecy. Mm -hmm. I think some prophecies can have 
multiple five, six, seven cycles of fulfillment. And so that's why I say, you know, we have to think about time, you know, this idea of the time, the scroll of time that God is really, you know, the events of scripture are, are unfolding like a scroll where mm-hmm. events keep cycling over and over again until we get to the final fulfillment. You know, I, and that's why even when I get to the Armageddon, I call that chapter David versus Goliath battle for heaven and earth. Cause it's really a repetition of David and Goliath. You have David, the, Ancestor of the Messiah, who is the, called the son of David, battling a Nephilim mm-hmm. for the fate of Israel. You know, Goliath said, if I win, you're all my slaves. I rule all of you. And so it's really, again, another, I think, dynamic foreshadow of what we're going to see at Armageddon. Tim, Tim Alberini, I just want to run this by you uh, with the, the idea of the, the Nephilim, the final Nephilim being the one who uh, is raised up to try to usurp the throne of earth, as it were. Uh, when we uh, talked with Tim Alberino about his book Birthright, he suggested that it it has to be a hybrid because it you have to have a human who can sit on the throne of Earth. The angels were created for their domain, which is the spirit realm. We were created for this domain, um, which is why Jesus Christ had to be fully divine and fully human, which again is a mind boggling concept. The uh, Fallen realm cannot replicate that. The best they can do is 50-50 instead of 100-100. Uh, and so that is why we're looking at uh, this entity, this this hybrid, to try to usurp the throne. Uh, i just curious, your thoughts on that uh, that interpretation. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, and I think this, this is a battle for heaven and earth, because we see that in Isaiah 14. It's not just about earth. It's also, I will sit above the mount of the congregation. It's about, you know, ruling over the angels, too. You know, the, the devil wants it all. And so, and I think that even the language of Revelation 13, that he's a man, but he's a beast. He's the beast, but he's the number of a man, which is the mark of the beast. I think it's all telling us that this is a hybrid being. He is two entities in one. He, the beast meaning the angelic side, of course, and then, and, then, and then being human, the fall angelic side and then being human. And then on top of that, what I also connect to, there are two other things that indicate that he's going to be a hybrid. One is that we don't discuss enough is that he's going to have literal supernatural powers, the Antichrist is going to be performing literal miracles. We don't discuss that enough. That this this is how the delusion is going to take place. He's going to be able to perform miracles. He's going to call fire down from heaven, which, by the way, in the Old Testament was a sign of God's approval time and time again when fire comes from heaven. It's from Yahweh. Mm-hmm. So this is how you know people are going to be deceived. He's going to have supernatural powers. And I also uh, connect it to the mark of the beast. And I think that's, again, where we're seeing this idea of the days of Noah, that I think that the mark of the beast is not just an economic control, which obviously it is, nothing can be bought or sold without the mark. But I also think it has a genetic component. And essentially what the Antichrist is going to offer is that when you get to Revelation 13, verse 4, the turning point for the world to worship the Antichrist is when he comes back from his mortal wound. It's th- that's at the point the world says, who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? That's when they think that he's unstoppable. He- he's God. And I think it, that's at the point where the mark of the beast is instituted. And I think what's going to happen is that the Antichrist is going to say, well, I cheated death. I overcame the grave. And you can, too, if you take this mark. And so by taking the mark, you're taking on the genetics of the beast. And that is altering you and making you something other than an image bearer of God which, of course, is why there's no repentance for the mark. So I think that you, once you take on a hybrid Nephilim DNA, that you are now disqualified from redemption, as it was in the days of Noah. So I think this is how, again, we're seeing this repetition of what the devil is trying to do in the days of Noah to corrupt the human genome to prevent salvation will happen again through the Antichrist and through the mark. How is this playing out? Um, we've had a lot of questions since the uh trying to be careful here because I don't want to get my YouTube channel canceled. Uh, but, uh, sure, since, <laughs> yeah, since the, uh, the, 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 um, the stick pin was, uh, was, uh, rolled out uh, about a year ago. Um, people have asked, is this the mark of the beast? And, uh, our, our response at Skywatch TV, Sharon and my, our, our interpretation is no, because there's a lot of revelation to get through before we get to revelation 13 and the beast is unveiled. But it's going to look a lot like this. What are what are your thoughts? I I agree, one hundred percent. Right. So, and it, it, just in the same way that even when we talk about uh, 
other other prophetic events of revelation that haven't happened yet that you know the 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 death of the two witnesses that it says the entire world sees that happening again those are things now we can understand that through cell phones right through what right. you know through our technology today so again we're seeing that this now i think what's happening now shows how it's plausible right it's not so we're, we're seeing a scenario that how this scenario could really happen given the technology we have today but that's this is not the market to be so i agree with you completely because there's more events of revelation and also I think Revelation is clear that this is going to be very clear, well promoted. This it says the mark has his name on it. It has the name of the beast. It's mm-hmm. connected to his name. So there's going to be no ambiguity that this isn't just a vitamin or a, a, some medicine. This is coming in the name of the Antichrist. So there's no there's no there's no debate about that. So yeah. I think yeah, it's take it, it and worship him or else. It's not what this is not the mark. Yeah. <laughs> the the first generation of um angels, watchers, sons of God who rebelled and uh, crossed the species barrier, wound up uh, in the abyss. So how would the angelic realm try to corrupt the bloodline of humanity this time around without uh, suffering the same punishment? Right. Yeah. So I think that two possible ways. The first, I kind of got into already, I think, through the mark, through the, the final Nephilim, that the mark will be the way of getting that corruption into the human okay. genome. Um, but also, you know, there could be a scenario, you know, I talk I, I talk about uh, the days of Noah and the end times flood being an angelic flood, a fallen angelic flood, where you have, again, those, those angels being released, the Genesis 6 apostate angels are going to be released from the abyss at the fifth trumpet. But you also have Satan and his angels who are in heaven. Those rebel angels are evicted from heaven, as we see in Revelation 12, and cast down to earth. So it's just like the flood where you have the waters coming from the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven. But now it's fallen angels. And I quote uh, a passage from uh, Hippolytus. And so it's uh, from his treatise on Christ and Antichrist. Uh, written in 202, circa 202 AD. And he, he, he paints this amazing picture of, he says, he basically says, imagine thousands of angels in the sky, bathed in light, singing beautifully, but they're fallen angels. This is describing the Revelation 12, and they present themselves as benevolent, kind beings to the world to deceive us. And so that's where I say, you know, if there's ever a time we're going to see a manifestation of the, the UFO phenomenon in the end times, it's to me, I was like, I was like, that's the point because they can present themselves and say, "Hey, you know, we came and seeded you on Earth seven thousand years ago, and now we're here. We're back to help you evolve to your to Homo sapien 2.0. And mm-hmm. and that could be where they say, oh, if you just take this or participate in this process with us, and that's that's where they could try to genetic <laughs> tampering as well. So, so it's like that. Uh- Twilight Zone episode where the cannabis show up and they've got all these wonderful things, free energy and uh, crops that grow anywhere and so on. And then we want to take you back to our home planet. Wait a minute. We've deciphered their text. It's a cookbook. (laughs) Anyway. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) But that's that that's a chapter that you included here, which uh, has been something that, uh, well, L.A. Marzulli has been talking about for a long, long time. The E.T. gospel. uh, this then exactly. corresponds to, or at least uh, helps explain the uh, mainstreaming of the UFO phenomenon here in recent uh, recent years. It, exactly. I mean, it's. I mean, obviously, LA is done a phenomenal job documenting that. That that now we're getting to the point where this government. It's not, I can't even say the. It's not just the U.S. government. Governments around the world are now just sharing classified files, confirming sightings. Can you know? So it, it's a. Uh, so I think, again, it's setting the stage, you know, whether intentionally or by spirit led, it's setting the stage for a scenario where, yeah, we could see something supernatural and they can present themselves that way and deceive the unbelieving. Hmm. The four angels bound in the river Euphrates. That's a puzzle that uh, students of end times prophecy have been trying to figure out since John sent his letter out. Uh, 2,000 years ago. (laughs) Sharon and I took a look at that and we just kind of threw up our arms and said, ah, no idea. No clue. Uh, What is your take? So, yeah, so, you know, I I wanted to really try and uh, take a stab at it. (laughs) So I'm not being dogmatic, but, you know, my take on it, so I really, 
I, I spent a lot of time really just grappling with this time frame that they are appointed for. So they're appointed for, you know, a year, a month, a day, and an hour. And uh, that's what I really honed in on. And, and of course, this is at the sixth trumpet. Mm -hmm. And so at the fifth trumpet, as we discussed, you have this 150 days of torment from the fallen angels who are from the days of Noah. And so what I look to for the sixth trumpet was the days of Lot. And looking at, you know, the that time frame, the year, the month, the day, and the hour, that's 392 days on the Hebrew calendar, because the hour is going to get you to the day 392. Okay. And so and so what I did from looking at the chronologies in scripture, going from the time you see uh from from Noah coming off the ark and the birth of our faxid getting down to where in the listed chronologies to the Lord showing up at, to Abraham to announce, to say where he uh, basically announces the next day, he's going to go see Sodom to see what is going on. The sins of Sodom before Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed is three was 392 years when you add up those, those genealogies. And so that's the connection I kind of made to the, to, to the days of Lot and the, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So I said, so I kind of drew that parallel. Hmm. And then what I also, what I found interesting is that when you look at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed by fire and brimstone. These four angels, they destroy uh, a, you know, a third you know, of the population with fire and brimstone. So it's the exact same punishment uh, as the days of Lot. And so that's kind of the connection I made uh, to try and unravel that very complex and difficult prophecy. That that is brilliant. That's the first time I've ever heard that, uh, and I, that's why I wanted to throw that question at you because I know this is kind of unique. Uh, like I said, I'm not ashamed to admit that Sharon and I took a stab at it, and um, the best we could come up with is Euphrates was kind of considered a boundary, uh, like a liminal zone between this world and the next realm, and likewise the Jordan River. In fact, that's uh, one reason that the mountains east of the Dead Sea were called the Mountains of Avarim, mountains uh, of the, the 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 black and chain um, encyclopedia of the Bible, which was published about a hundred years ago. They um, interpreted Avarim, A-B-A-R-I-M, as meaning uh, mm -hmm. those on the other side. And assuming oh, wow. that they met the the mountains on the other side, but they didn't. This is one of those things where where archaeology helps out. A cognate term, same word, different language from Ugaritic around the time of the judges, was used to, to for for the spirits of the Rephaim, because they traveled or they're on the other side. They cross over. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and so yeah. we've got that again. The Jordan River is sort of a liminal boundary. Yeah, the mountains are on the other side, but that's also the area that uh, was. There were some references in the Exodus uh, route uh, that referred to spirits of the dead and so forth. So you got something, some, and, and of course that's where Ezekiel puts the uh, conclusion of the Gog Magog War, you know, the Valley of the Travelers, the Valley of the Avarim, east of the sea, east of the Dead Sea. Um, something about that area that was really significant spiritually back in the day. But uh, like I said, that that was as close as we got to the whole thing. Okay, Jordan River, Euphrates River, boundaries. Good enough. We'll let it. We'll get it go from there. But this, this, I think is this is brilliant. Thank you, thank you. And I really, again, it, it also lines up. That's why I said that you know we understand how God is repeating things. I mean, Jesus said as he said as was in the days of Noah, but then in Luke he says likewise as it was in the days of Lot. He lines them up back to back, and the judgments. You know, again, when you look at Second Peter chapter two, when you look in Jude. The judgment of the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah are connected yes. several times throughout Scripture. They're, they're listed back to back. And so here we see the judgments are back to back. You have the days of Noah judgment at the fifth trumpet and the, the Sodom and Gomorrah judgment at the sixth trumpet. So it's more than just connecting the sexual sin of the angels from Genesis 6 to the sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's actually the judgments are also connected. Exactly. Exactly. I, I will make notes and I'm probably going to steal that, but I promise I'll give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> that is, yeah. no, that is really, it took me some time. <laughs> that is yeah. really good. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah. yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. So the, the mounted troops twice, 10,000 times 10,000. So we are often taught that that is, uh, must be a Chinese army because they're coming from the East. And, uh, that's the only country in the world that could field an army like that. 
I actually looked up how many soldiers are in the Chinese army. It's like uh, 2.5 million or something. It's nowhere near 200 million. So what are these 200 million horsemen? Yeah, so I think these are... These are fallen angelic. We're seeing fallen angelic demonic horses. These are spirit realm beings. These are fallen spirit realm beings to me. Um, and again, when you look at just, you know, the, the Bible is clear that there are billions of angels. There are multitudes upon multitudes of angels. So the fact that there would be this many fallen angels in an army, from a, from a purely biblical standpoint, I think is you can really find the support for that rather than being the army of China. And credit to you for actually looking that up, because I've heard that so many times. <laughs> You're the first person I've ever heard to you actually confirmed how many soldiers are in that army. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think it's it, but I think it's a, 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 this is the angelic army making their last stand, essentially. Hmm. How, how has our tendency here in the 20th and 21st century to look for natural explanations uh, for, for these, these apocalyptic events. How has that kind of taken us away from the understanding of these prophecies that were held by the early church, but even, uh, again, the great biblical scholars of years gone by, guys who didn't have the benefit of, you know, having the uh, electronic Bible on the iPad that they could just pull it up and do a quick search. I mean, they actually had to go into libraries, collect reference materials themselves, and dig into the actual paper copies. Uh, <laughs> how have we d- drifted away through our naturalistic interpretations? Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it, it, it's sad. It's unfortunate, you know, because we're we're leaving so much on the cutting room floor. You know, I say you just understanding the supernatural interpretation of Genesis chapter six to me is like going from black and white TV to 4K. You know, that alone will change how you see the Bible and open up so much more. And then when you get to Revelation, seeing these things for what they are, you know, this is what God has told us. This is a, you know, uh, I started Judgment of Nephilim by saying humanity is in the midst of a war. So we're in the middle of a war that started before our creation. Mm-hmm. So these, the, the fallen angels have been battling God's kingdom of righteous angels before we were created. We were thrust into a middle of a conflict that predates us. And so we have to keep that perspective and not just assign everything to it's a human leader. It's the Chinese army because there's a bigger conflict going on. And so, one, we're missing that, which hurts us to our understanding of the Bible. But two, and this is what really uh, is a burden of mine, is that other religions, other belief systems, the new age, they are they're they they're all they are fully engaged in trying to engage the spiritual realm and say, yes, there is a spirit realm. Yes, the spirit realm is real and we have the answers, but they don't have the answer. So we want to so I think it can hurt our witness because we're leaving a lot of room for other belief systems to t- supplant Christianity because we're not acknowledging what people want to know about. They have mm. a desire to know about the supernatural and we have the answers. And obviously ministries like yours and yours and Sharon's, you know, uh, we, we're we're not scared to go there. So there, so it's important. So I'm not, you know, so there are those of us who are happily living in the supernatural realm in the work that we do. But we need to, as Christians, take to embrace it. You know, we worship a supernatural God who gave us a supernatural salvation with a supernatural Bible. So why not just acknowledge it that way? <laughs> yeah. Because I can't understand it. I want it to fit into a neat little box. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> our, our friend Guy Malone, who's uh, in Roswell, New Mexico. In fact, he's running for mayor of Roswell now, but he's been there for many years. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Declared his candidacy a couple Great. of weeks ago on this program, I'm proud to say. He uh, <laughs> has been our missionary to Roswell for quite some time. And I, I love the way he put it. He said, the price of admission to this club that we call Christian Christianity is believing that a carpenter 2,000 years ago in a dusty corner of the Roman Empire miraculously prophesied his own return from the dead and then made it happen. And yet somehow we expect the rest of the stuff in the Bible to make sense and correspond to our understanding of the science. So, uh, yeah, Guy is, was right on with that. And God bless the scholars like Mike Heiser, and uh, we pray for him uh, and his uh, health struggles oh, right now. But uh, for, for being a PhD, he was willing to step forward and say, yeah, yeah, this is what this means. So... Exactly. Uh, Ryan, yeah. where, where do Amen. people where do people get copies of Judgment of the Nephilim and the Last Nephilim? Yeah, so uh, my website is judgmentofthenephilim.com, one word. Uh, it's also available on Amazon.com. It's available on Barnes and Nobles. Uh, in addition to that, along with the book, I have uh, two documentaries I filmed. 
uh, Judgment Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, as well as the Final Nephilim Battle of Heaven, for Heaven and Earth. And those are high-level overviews. Uh, if you want to know the book in a night, and I, that's for you. And I made complimentary study guides as well. Yeah. Um, so for those who want to get really deep into it, but all that's available at judgmentofnephilim.com. It's also available in digital on demand. And, uh, and speaking of digital, also one thing I want to mention too, in the final Nephilim, in addition to the fact that it's a longer book, uh, I also included video commentary. So there are QR codes there yes. throughout the book that have video commentary. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. All yes. the cool so kids can, are using those these uh, days. What's that? Uh, that? All the cool kids oh, are using kids. those these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm trying to keep up with the cool kids, but yeah, so you can, um, <laughs> you know, throughout get uh, use your phone, your tablet, and there's video commentary there, and I put in a bonus commentary too that's not in in the written book about uh, end times Nephilim deception in pop culture, talking about the books, especially targeted at teenagers, ah. about the Nephilim that deal with fallen angels, cherubim, seraphim, right, right in the title, they reference Genesis six, they, I mean Enoch. But these books are distorting the account. In these books, the Nephilim are the heroes. The fallen angels are are being forbidden by an angry God from falling in love. And there are even some where the Nephilim are actually told that they are the Messiah mm -hmm. of humanity. Mm -hmm. So uh, really, really distorting God's word. So I put a special bonus uh, section about that. Yeah, and that's important. Uh, I've talked a little bit in the past about the, uh, the Rick Reardon series that uh, Disney's now picked up and they brought in other authors to mine the the religions of the ancient world to uh, and this is for young readers this is not even for teen readers like you're talking about but you've got uh, kids that are just coming out of middle school who are reading uh, to say percy jackson and the olympians series but now they've got uh, other books that are uh, going into the mayan uh, religion the korean religion uh, the norse the egyptian uh, and so on and um a lot of christian parents just because oh well you know it's getting the kid to read so i guess it's okay yeah but the study guides uh you know, have the students write an essay on which god or goddess they would want to be the child of. Well, uh, wow, yeah, that, that's that's that that's heavy. But again, I think it goes back to your point because when we are thinking about these things in terms of we're wrestling with principalities and powers, our discernment and our radar for these things is going to be way higher. Which is why it's important that we keep this focus because the devil's going to use any angle he can, and these books and. uh movies are and they're, they're and they're going like you said they're getting younger and younger i mean i even know middle school i mean that's mm -hmm. it's they're going young to really bring an occult revival essentially to this next generation exactly ryan peterson is the author of the final nephilim that is his newest book of course judgment of the nephilim is earlier work and you'll find both of those available amazon and his website uh, judgment of the nephilim.com and uh, ryan thank you very much for your time tonight we really appreciate your work and look forward to seeing you in uh, colorado springs Absolutely, Dark. Thank you so much. God bless. Always a pleasure. And we'll tell you how you can join us in Colorado Springs straight ahead as a view from the bunker continues. Talking the walk every Sunday from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You follow us online, vftb.net. That's the website. Social media, Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. On Facebook, the Facebook page, View from the Bunker. And uh, all the new social media sites, Gab Me, We Get Her Parlor, at Derek P. Gilbert. A couple of conferences to tell you about, including the one where you'll uh, see Sharon and me and uh, Ryan Peterson in just a few moments. But a couple of stories here that uh, I think are worth discussing very quickly before we uh, go into all of the boilerplate uh, plugs and so forth. Th th this showdown between the United States, NATO on one side and uh, Russia on the other over Ukraine doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, I recognize that I am a lay person, uh, which is why I was able to talk this uh, past week to Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, retired from the U.S. Army. Colonel David Giamona, likewise, retired from the U.S. Army. Um, both of them 
have some insight as to what's going on there. And uh, both of them conclude that this is uh, not something that's being done because of the national security interests of the United States, the United Kingdom, or NATO particularly. And uh, while we can look at it on the surface and say, you know, with Partygate in the UK, with uh, Joe Biden's poll approval numbers at uh, just abysmally low uh, right now, both of them could use a distraction. So uh, that, that may explain to a degree, the wag the dog feel that we're getting out of all of this. I mean, this past week, both the UK and US government came out um, claiming that Russia is planning to release a video depicting graphic scenes of a staged false explosion with corpses, actors depicting mourners, and images of destroyed locations and military equipment. This is uh, per CNN's report. They're, they're literally talking about crisis actors. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> here in the U.S. We've been looking at various situations, and I know that there's a little cottage industry out there that tries to find uh, video online that they can apply, that they can claim are crisis actors for every major tragedy, mass shooting, etc. for the last 20 years. You, You can almost clock it within hours there'll be somebody claiming that this wasn't real crisis actors and yet now the united states government is claiming that their intelligence tells them that russia is planning a false flag a fake false flag complete with crisis actors to justify going in in other words they're saying that russia is going to set up something like wag the dog if you've not seen the film wag the dog you need to Just understand what I'm talking about. But also, even though it's played for laughs in places, there is a real element of truth behind that film. And that appears to be what's going on here. Now, what was really interesting is that Matt Lee, reporter for the Associated Press, at a press conference at the State Department, confronted uh, State Department spokesman Ned Price on this, this claim. Uh, Price basically said, um, this is what's going to happen. Russia is going to fake this explosion. They're going to use it to justify going into Ukraine. Now, Matt Lee has been a reporter for a long time. And I'm surprised that these spokespersons at the White House ever, ever call on Matt Lee. Because he is generally, other than Peter Ducey of Fox occasionally, um, Matt Lee is generally the one who asks the most pertinent questions. The obvious question here is when Ned Price, spokesperson for the State Department, comes out and says, Russia is going to do this, we're sure of it, Matt Lee says, um, okay, what's the evidence? And the response from the spokesperson who just accused Russia of preparing to fake a justification for a war that could involve most of the Western world, he said, oh, I just gave it to you. And Lee pointed out the obvious. No, you didn't. You just said Russia's going to do this, but you haven't given us any evidence. What's the evidence? Well, I just told you. No, you didn't. You can find the video on YouTube. It's really, I mean, it's bizarre, this confrontation. Lee didn't back down. It went on for about five minutes, and finally Price went out and called somebody else to uh, get out of this. It was really uncomfortable for uh, Ned Price, but it should have been. There should have been other reporters saying, hey, wait a minute. I want to follow up on what Matt asked there. Because you're accusing the Russian government of getting ready to start a war on false pretenses. What evidence do you have? Um, Well, I just gave it to you. And Price actually played this card. He said, well, I'm sorry if you don't believe my... If you'd rather believe the Russian government than believe your own government. It's like, wait. (laughs) Wait a minute. Nobody is carrying water for Vladimir Putin here. But you're trying to justify going to war with Russia perhaps, by accusing Russia of faking a justification for invading a neighboring country. What is the evidence? I mean, to Matt Lee's credit, he said, look, I'm old enough to remember that you guys told us that Kabul, capital of Afghanistan, would not fall to the Taliban. And less than than 30 days later, uh, it fell to the Taliban. Remember that? This is bizarre. Watching what's happening here in real time is bizarre. It's, 
the government now is just blatantly putting out this information that anyone with a rational thinking brain and say, this, this cannot be true. It, it doesn't make any sense. And the government would just turn around and say, well, you must be a communist then. You must be a supporter of... What? Just pray that cooler heads prevail. Because I, I've, I've read a, a number of stories on the war games that have been done by think tanks in Washington, D.C. What happens if the United States were to get involved with a... Uh, in, in a conflict with, with uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. And the results, the end results are never pretty. We don't have enough forces there and our supply lines are too long. If we try to slug it out on the ground with Russia in Eastern Europe, we lose. This is what the experts who've been wargaming this have found. And, and by the way, just so you're aware, the same thing holds true when they run war games where the United States tries to defend Taiwan against a Chinese invasion. The only thing that has changed over the 10 years or 15 years, whatever it is, that they've been running these war games is that the, uh, the guys wargaming the American side in the China-Taiwan conflict lose faster and faster each time. I know we Americans have this idea that, that we've carried with us since World War II, really, that our military is invincible. It is not. It is the most powerful on earth, but there are other nations out there with some very smart people as well who figured out how to take our strengths and turn them against us. Yeah, we got these great aircraft carriers, but uh, hypersonic missiles, sadly, turn those carriers into uh, great big sitting ducks. Anyway, I, I love this line, Matt Lee, and this is not to disparage Alex Jones, who does some good work. But uh, Matt Lee of the Associated Press, in trying to get Ned Price of the State Department to actually present or produce some evidence for this claim that Russia is going to fake an attack to justify going to war with Ukraine, uh, he said, look, this is like Alex Jones territory you're getting into now. And Price didn't have an answer for him. It's basically, well, (laughs) you're either going to believe me or you must be a Russia lover. What a world. The one bit of good news this past week is that it seems that the narrative is changing. Johns Hopkins University, researchers led by uh, the uh, founder of uh, a, uh, one of the schools at Johns Hopkins University, has uh, released a study this past week that um, concluded that the lockdown policies of governments in uh, Europe and the United States only reduced the uh, COVID deaths by 0.2%. While at the same time, crashing our economies into the wall. So um, hopefully this will convince some of our uh, state and local leaders to uh, just give it up already. There, There have been studies out there for more than a year, 18 months now, there was a study published by Stanford that showed that uh, masks really don't do anything. Mask mandates, uh, and that information is widely available on the web. Mask mandates have had no impact whatsoever on the, uh, the curves of new infections or deaths. And now Johns Hopkins concluding that the lockdown policies were uh, ill-advised and ineffective and should not be used in a pandemic uh, to respond to a pandemic at any point in the future. Here's the thing. You might remember that uh, Johns Hopkins ran the tabletop exercise in May of 2018 called Clade X. Sharon watched that when they did it live because she's always watching for emerging diseases. Her degree is in molecular biology. And so she's been looking. We've been following stuff like this, mainly her, since we began our ministry uh, at our, what, our podcast began in 2005, PID Radio. She was watching even before then because that's her training. She's loves biology and is fascinated by the intricate design by which God created us. But uh, Clade X concluded during their tabletop exercise that lockdowns weren't going to work. This was, again, May of 2018, 18 months before COVID-19 began to trickle out of China. 
What's the point of doing these tabletop exercises of wargaming a pandemic response if you're not going to apply the lessons you learned during the tabletop exercise? (laughs) Again, that was one of the lessons that came out of Claydex. Lockdowns aren't going to work. What did we do? Locked everything down. Crashed the economy into a wall. Again, it has a very wag the dog feel to it. Because, of course, the World Economic Forum stepped up and said, ah, This is our opportunity to completely redesign human civilization. Yeah, God complex. Well, we're going to be talking about that the first weekend in March. This is uh, just a month away. The return of Saturn and the Great Reset. Sharon and I will be teaching for a weekend retreat for His Call Ministries at the Finley River Ranch just outside Sparta, Missouri. Now, Sparta is about halfway between Springfield and and Branson. So if you're in the Ozarks, Southern Missouri, Northern Arkansas, even uh, Western Oklahoma, Western Kansas, or Eastern Oklahoma, Eastern Kansas directions, not my strong suit. Uh, We actually had some folks, a couple of young men who came last year from Pennsylvania. Bless you guys. Uh, March 4th through 7th are the dates. It is a weekend retreat, Friday evening, Saturday, and then Sunday morning. And we'll be talking about uh, end times prophecy, how the great reset fits into it. And uh, the, uh, parallels or the uh should have pulled this out and had this ready to go uh from my book uh the second coming of saturn what does this have to do with the great reset um what does a 2000 year old poem from a latin or roman poet have to do with any of this uh we'll get into all of that that weekend you can find out more online and register at hiscallministries.com Joyce Stevenson is uh, coordinating the sign-ups there, hiscallministries.com. Then two weeks later, we'll be in Dallas for the Eyes to See conference. This is from Hear the Watchman, Mike Kerr and Jeannie Moore, March 18th through 20th. This will be at the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center in Grapevine, Texas, which is just outside, uh, just, uh, well, it's very close to the International Airport there. So uh, fly into Dallas, and uh, you can take the shuttle to the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center. Join us there. It's going to be a great weekend. I should have had the uh, speaker list pulled up in front of me. Uh, But uh, besides Sharon and me, uh, I know L.A. Marzulli will be there. Um, There we go. Pastor Paul Begley, Dave Hodges of the Common Sense Show, Dr. Michael Lake, Tom Dunn, Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, uh, Ohio Brett, John and Chelsea Jubilee. And um, we hope to see you there as well. And we can save you 20 bucks. Save $20 on the registration for the Eyes to See Conference, March 17th through 20th. Use promo code GILBERT20, GILBERT20. When you sign up, that will save you 20 bucks at hearthewatchmen.com. Then, come May, we will be in Colorado Springs. Ryan Peterson, Gary Stearman, Mondo Gonzalez, Ellie Marzulli, Sharon and me, Ken Johnson, Dr. Tommy Ice, uh, Brent Miller Sr., Brent Miller Jr., our good friend Josh Peck, uh, Bill Salas, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Bob McGinnis, Doug Woodward, and many others. Uh, this will be a uh, prophecy conference, uh, wonderful gathering, because it's been a while since we've gotten together with our friends at Prophecy Watchers. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, May 19th through 22nd, the dates, and uh, uh, Colorado Springs Marriott, the location, and registration online at prophecywatchers.com. Skywatch TV's Tour of Israel, March 19th through 30th of 2023. We're also in the process of finalizing dates. Um, Just need to get an email back to confirm, but uh, finalizing dates for a tour of Turkey in October of 2022. Probably the second two weeks of October. We plan to visit the uh, uh, the churches of Revelation and Gobekli Tepe, among other sites. Um, if you're interested, drop me an email, Derek at GilbertHouse.org, Derek at GilbertHouse.org. We're going to keep this tour small, roughly two dozen people. That'll probably cap it, but um, we're going to see some fantastic archaeological sites um, and uh, explain the prophetic significance of those. One of the sites called Pamukkale which uh, in ancient days was called the Plutonion from Pluto, the god of the Roman god of the dead. In other words, the gates of hell. So yes, we're, we're going to visit the gates of hell as well as the churches of Revelation. Um, but again, if you're interested, we, we still need to confirm dates, but if you're interested, late October 2022, drop me a note, Derek at GilbertHouse.org. And uh, you can also drop a note at uh, 
Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever else you find us. We appreciate your uh, your reviews and your support. Or give us a like on Facebook at our Facebook page there. Our announcer is DC Good. And a view from the bunker is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is A View from the Bunker.